Gates of Imagination presents The Coming of Abel Behenna by Bram Stoker, read by Arthur Lane. The little Cornish port of Pencastle was bright in the early April, when the sun had seemingly come to stay after a long and bitter winter. Boldly and blackly, the rock stood out against a background of shaded blue, where the sky fading into mist met the far horizon. The sea was of true Cornish hue, sapphire, save where it became deep emerald green in the fathomless depths under the cliffs, where the seal caves opened their grim jaws. On the slopes, the grass was parched and brown. The spikes of firs bushes were ashy grey, but the golden yellow of their flowers streamed along the hillside, dipping out in lines as the rock cropped up and lessening into patches and dots till finally it died away altogether, where the sea winds swept round the jutting cliffs and cut short the vegetation as though with an ever-working aerial shears. The whole hillside, with its body of brown and flashes of yellow, was just like a colossal yellow hammer. The little harbour opened from the sea between towering cliffs, and behind a lonely rock, pierced with many caves and blowholes through which the sea in storm time sent its thunderous voice, together with a fountain of drifting spume. Hence it wound westwards in a serpentine course, guarded at its entrance by two little curving piers to left and right. These were roughly built of dark slates placed endways and held together with great beams bound with iron bands. Thence it flowed up the rocky bed of the stream, whose winter torrents had of old cut out its way amongst the hills. This stream was deep at first, with here and there where it widened, patches of broken rock exposed at low water, full of holes where crabs and lobsters were to be found at the ebb of the tide. From amongst the rocks rose sturdy posts, used for warping in the little coasting vessels which frequented the port. Higher up, the stream still flowed deeply, for the tide ran far inland, but always calmly for all the force of the wildest storm was broken below. Some quarter mile inland, the stream was deep at high water, but at low tide, there were at each side patches of the same broken rock as lower down, through the chinks of which the sweet water of the natural stream trickled and murmured, after the tide had ebbed away. Here, too, rose mooring posts for the fishermen's boats. At either side of the river was a row of cottages down almost on the level of high tide. They were pretty cottages, strongly and snugly built, with trim, narrow gardens in front, full of old-fashioned plants, flowering currants, coloured primroses, wallflower and stonecrop. Over the fronts of many of them climbed clematis and wisteria. The window sides and door posts of all were as white as snow, and the little pathway to each was paved with light-coloured stones. At some of the doors were tiny porches, whilst at others were rustic seats cut from tree trunks or from old barrels. In nearly every case the window ledges were filled with boxes or pots of flowers or foliage plants. Two men lived in cottages exactly opposite each other across the stream. Two men, both young, both good-looking, both prosperous, and who had been companions and rivals from their boyhood. Abel Behenna was dark with the gypsy darkness which the Phoenician mining wanderers left in their track. Eric Sanson, which the local antiquarian said was a corruption of Sagamanson, was fair, with the ruddy hue which marked the path of the wild Norseman. These two seemed to have singled out each other from the very beginning to work and strive together, to fight for each other, and to stand back to back in all endeavours. They had now put the coping stone on their temple of unity by falling in love with the same girl. Sarah Trefusis was certainly the prettiest girl in Pencastle, and there was many a young man who would gladly have tried his fortune with her, but that there were two to contend against, and each of these the strongest and most resolute man in the port, except the other. The average young man thought that this was very hard, and on account of it bore no good will to either of the three principals whilst the average young woman who had, lest worse should befall, to put up with the grumbling of her sweetheart and the sense of being only second best which it implied, did not either, be sure, regard Sarah with friendly eye. Thus it came in the course of a year or so, for rustic courtship is a slow process, that the two men and woman found themselves thrown much together. They were all satisfied, so it did not matter, and Sarah, who was vain and something frivolous, took care to have her revenge on both men and women in a quiet way. When a young woman in her walking out can only boast one not quite satisfied young man, it is no particular pleasure to her to see her escort cast sheep's eyes at a better-looking girl supported by two devoted swains. 
At length there came a time which Sarah dreaded, and which she had tried to keep distant, the time when she had to make her choice between the two men. She liked them both, and indeed, either of them might have satisfied the ideas of even a more exacting girl. But her mind was so constituted that she thought more of what she might lose than of what she might gain. And whenever she thought she had made up her mind, she became instantly assailed with doubts as to the wisdom of her choice. Always the man whom she had presumably lost became endowed afresh with a newer and more bountiful crop of advantages than had ever arisen from the possibility of his acceptance. She promised each man that on her birthday she would give him his answer, and that day, the 11th of April, had now arrived. The promises had been given singly and confidentially, but each was given to a man who was not likely to forget. Early in the morning she found both men hovering round her door. Neither had taken the other into his confidence, and each was simply seeking an early opportunity of getting his answer and advancing his suit if necessary. Damon, as a rule, does not take Pythias with him when making a proposal, and in the heart of each man his own affairs had a claim far above any requirements of friendship. So throughout the day they kept seeing each other out. The position was doubtless somewhat embarrassing to Sarah, and though the satisfaction of her vanity that she should be thus adored was very pleasing, yet there were moments when she was annoyed with both men for being so persistent. Her only consolation at such moments was that she saw, through the elaborate smiles of the other girls, when in passing they noticed her door thus doubly guarded, the jealousy which filled their hearts. Sarah's mother was a person of commonplace and sordid ideas, and seeing all along the state of affairs, her one intention, persistently expressed to her daughter in the plainest words, was to so arrange matters that Sarah should get all that was possible out of both men. With this purpose, she had cunningly kept herself as far as possible in the background in the matter of her daughter's wooings, and watched in silence. At first, Sarah had been indignant with her for her sordid views, but, as usual, her weak nature gave way before persistence, and she had now got to the stage of acceptance. She was not surprised when her mother whispered to her in the little yard behind the house. Go up the hillside for a while. I want to talk to these two. They're both red hot for you, and now's the time to get things fixed. Sarah began a feeble remonstrance, but her mother cut her short. I tell you, girl, that my mind is made up. Both these men want you, and only one can have you. But before you choose, it'll be so arranged that you'll have all that both have got. Don't argue, child. Go up the hillside, and when you come back, I'll have it fixed. I see a way quite easy. So Sarah went up the hillside through the narrow paths between the golden firs, and Mrs. Trefusis joined the two men in the living room of the little house. She opened the attack with the desperate courage which is in all mothers when they think for their children, howsoever mean the thoughts may be. Ye two men, you're both in love with my Sarah. Their bashful silence gave consent to the barefaced proposition. She went on, neither of ye has much. Again they tacitly acquiesced in the soft impeachment. I don't know that either of ye could keep a wife. Though neither said a word, their looks and bearing expressed distinct dissent. Mrs. Trefusis went on, But if you'd put what you both have together, you'd make a comfortable home for one of you, and Sarah. She eyed the men keenly, with her cunning eyes half shut, as she spoke. Then, satisfied from her scrutiny that the idea was accepted, she went on quickly, as if to prevent argument. The girl likes you both, and mayhap it's hard for her to choose. Why don't you toss up for her? First put your money together. You've each got a bit put by, I know. Let the lucky man take the lot and trade with it a bit, and then come home and marry her. Neither of you's afraid, I suppose. And neither of you'll say that he won't do that much for the girl that you both say you love. Abel broke the silence. It don't seem the square thing to toss for the girl. She wouldn't like it herself. And it doesn't seem, seem respectful like to her, Eric interrupted. He was conscious that his chance was not so good as Abel's, in case Sarah should wish to choose between them. Are you afraid of the hazard? Not me, said Abel boldly. Mrs. Trefusis, seeing that her idea was beginning to work, followed up the advantage. It is settled that you put your money together to make a home for her, whether you toss for her or leave it for her to choose. Yes, said Eric quickly, and Abel agreed with equal sturdiness. Mrs. Trefusis's little cunning eyes twinkled. She heard Sarah's step in the yard and said, 
Well, here she comes, and I leave it to her. And she went out. During her brief walk on the hillside, Sarah had been trying to make up her mind. She was feeling almost angry with both men for being the cause of her difficulty, and as she came into the room said shortly, I want to have a word with you both. Come to the Flagstaff Rock, where we can be alone. She took her hat and went out of the house up the winding path to the steep rock crowned with a high flagstaff, where once the wrecker's fire basket used to burn. This was the rock which formed the northern jaw of the little harbour. There was only room on the path for two abreast, and it marked the state of things pretty well when, by a sort of implied arrangement, Sarah went first, and the two men followed, walking abreast and keeping step. By this time, each man's heart was boiling with jealousy. When they came to the top of the rock, Sarah stood against the flagstaff, and the two young men stood opposite her. She had chosen her position with knowledge and intention, for there was no room for anyone to stand beside her. They were all silent for a while. Then Sarah began to laugh and said, I promised the both of you to give you an answer today. I've been thinking and thinking and thinking, till I began to get angry with you both for plaguing me so. And even now, I don't seem any nearer than ever I was to making up my mind. Eric said suddenly, let us toss for it, lass. Sarah showed no indignation whatever at the proposition. Her mother's eternal suggestion had schooled her to the acceptance of something of the kind, and her weak nature made it easy to her to grasp at any way out of the difficulty. She stood with downcast eyes idly picking at the sleeve of her dress, seeming to have tacitly acquiesced in the proposal. Both men instinctively realising this pulled each a coin from his pocket, spun it in the air, and dropped his other hand over the palm on which it lay. For a few seconds they remained thus, all silent. Then Abel, who was the more thoughtful of the men, spoke. Sarah, is this good? As he spoke he removed the upper hand from the coin and placed the latter back in his pocket. Sarah was nettled. Good or bad, it's good enough for me. Take it or leave it as you like, she said, to which he replied quickly. Nay, lass, aught that concerns you is good enough for me. I did but think of you lest you might have pain or disappointment hereafter. If you love Eric better nor me, in God's name say so, and I think I'm man enow to stand aside. Likewise, if I'm the one, don't make us both miserable for life. Face to face with a difficulty, Sarah's weak nature proclaimed itself. She put her hands before her face and began to cry, saying, It was my mother. She keeps telling me. The silence which followed was broken by Eric, who said hotly to Abel, let the lass alone, can't you? If she wants to choose this way, let her. It's good enough for me and for you too. She said it now and must abide by it. Hereupon Sarah turned upon him in sudden fury and cried, Hold your tongue. What is it to you at any rate? And she resumed her crying. Eric was so flabbergasted that he had not a word to say, but stood looking particularly foolish, with his mouth open and his hands held out with the coin still between them. All were silent till Sarah, taking her hands from her face, laughed hysterically and said, As you two can't make up your minds, I'm going home. And she turned to go. Stop, said Abel in an authoritative voice. Eric, you hold the coin and I'll cry. Now, before we settle it, let us clearly understand. The man who wins takes all the money that we both have got, brings it to Bristol and ships on a voyage and trades with it. Then he comes back and marries Sarah, and they two keep all whatever there may be, as the result of the trading. Is this what we understand? Yes, said Eric. I'll marry him on my next birthday, said Sarah. Having said it, the intolerably mercenary spirit of her actions seemed to strike her, and impulsively she turned away with a bright blush. Fire seemed to sparkle in the eyes of both men, said Eric. A year so be. The man that wins is to have one year. Toss, cried Abel, and the coin spun in the air. Eric caught it and again held it between his outstretched hands. Heads! cried Abel, a pallor sweeping over his face as he spoke. As he leaned forward to look, Sarah leaned forward too, and their heads almost touched. He could feel her hair blowing on his cheek, and it thrilled through him like fire. Eric lifted his upper hand. The coin lay with its head up. Abel stepped forward and took Sarah in his arms. With a curse, Eric hurled the coin far into the sea. Then he leaned against the flagstaff and scowled at the others with his hands thrust deep into his pockets. 
Abel whispered wild words of passion and delight into Sarah's ears, and as she listened, she began to believe that fortune had rightly interpreted the wishes of her secret heart, and that she loved Abel best. Presently, Abel looked up and caught sight of Eric's face as the last ray of sunset struck it. The red light intensified the natural ruddiness of his complexion, and he looked as though he were steeped in blood. Abel did not mind his scowl, for now that his own heart was at rest, he could feel unalloyed pity for his friend. He stepped over meaning to comfort him, and held out his hand, saying, It was my chance, old lad. Don't grudge it me. I'll try to make Sarah a happy woman, and you shall be a brother to us both. Brother be damned, was all the answer Eric made, as he turned away. When he had gone a few steps down the rocky path, he turned and came back. Standing before Abel and Sarah, who had their arms round each other, he said, You have a year, make the most of it, and be sure you're in time to claim your wife. Be back to have your bands up in time to be married on the 11th of April. If you're not, I tell you I shall have my bands up, and you may get back too late. What do you mean, Eric? You are mad. No more mad than you are, Abel Behenna. You go, that's your chance. I stay, that's mine. I don't mean to let the grass grow under my feet. Sarah cared no more for you than for me five minutes ago, and she may come back to that five minutes after you're gone. You won by a point only. The game may change. The game won't change, said Abel shortly. Sarah, you'll be true to me. You won't marry till I return. For a year, added Eric quickly. That's the bargain. I promise for the year, said Sarah. A dark look came over Abel's face, and he was about to speak, but he mastered himself and smiled. I mustn't be too hard or get angry tonight. Come, Eric, we played and fought together. I won fairly. I played fairly all the game of our wooing. You know that as well as I do. And now when I'm going away, I shall look to my old and true comrade to help me when I'm gone. I'll help you none, said Eric. So help me God. It was God helped me, said Abel simply. Then let him go on helping you, said Eric angrily. The devil is good enough for me and without another word he rushed down the steep path and disappeared behind the rocks. When he had gone, Abel hoped for some tender passage with Sarah, but the first remark she made chilled him. How lonely it all seems without Eric! And this note sounded till he had left her at home, and after. Early on the next morning, Abel heard a noise at his door, and on going out saw Eric walking rapidly away. A small canvas bag full of gold and silver lay on the threshold. On a small slip of paper pinned to it was written, Take the money and go. I stay. God for you, the devil for me. Remember the 11th of April. Eric Sanson. That afternoon, Abel went off to Bristol, and a week later sailed on the Star of the Sea bound for Pahang. His money, including that which had been Eric's, was on board in the shape of a venture of cheap toys. He had been advised by a shrewd old mariner of Bristol whom he knew and who knew the ways of the Chersonese, who predicted that every penny invested would be returned with a shilling to boot. As the year wore on, Sarah became more and more disturbed in her mind. Eric was always at hand to make love to her in his own persistent, masterful manner, and to this she did not object. Only one letter came from Abel, to say that his venture had proved successful, and that he had sent some two hundred pounds to the bank at Bristol, and was trading with fifty pounds still remaining in goods for China, whither the Star of the Sea was bound, and whence she would return to Bristol. He suggested that Eric's share of the venture should be returned to him with his share of the profits. This proposition was treated with anger by Eric, and as simply childish by Sarah's mother. More than six months had since then elapsed, but no other letter had come, and Eric's hopes which had been dashed down by the letter from Pahang began to rise again. He perpetually assailed Sarah with an if. If Abel did not return, would she then marry him? If the 11th of April went by without Abel being in the port, would she give him over? If Abel had taken his fortune and married another girl on the head of it, would she marry him, Eric, as soon as the truth were known? And so on, in an endless variety of possibilities. The power of the strong will and the determined purpose over the woman's weaker nature became in time manifest. Sarah began to lose her faith in Abel, and to regard Eric as a possible husband. And a possible husband is in a woman's eye different to all other men. A new affection for him began to arise in her breast, and the daily familiarities of permitted courtship 
furthered the growing affection. Sarah began to regard Abel as rather a rock in the road of her life, and had it not been for her mother's constantly reminding her of the good fortune already laid by in the Bristol Bank, she would have tried to have shut her eyes altogether to the fact of Abel's existence. The, the 11th of April was Saturday, so that in order to have the marriage on that day it would be necessary that the bans should be called on Sunday, the 22nd of March. From the beginning of that month, Eric kept perpetually on the subject of Abel's absence, and his outspoken opinion that the latter was either dead or married began to become a reality to the woman's mind. As the first half of the month wore on, Eric became more jubilant, and after church on the 15th, he took Sarah for a walk to the Flagstaff Rock. There he asserted himself strongly. I told Abel, and you too, that if he was not here to put up his bands in time for the 11th, I would put up mine for the 12th. Now the time has come when I mean to do it. He hasn't kept his word. Here Sarah struck in out of her weakness and indecision. He hasn't broken it yet. Eric ground his teeth with anger. If you mean to stick up for him, he said, as he smote his hands savagely on the flagstaff, which sent forth a shivering murmur. Well and good. I'll keep my part of the bargain. On Sunday, I shall give notice of the bans, and you can deny them in the church if you will. If Abel is in Pencastle on the 11th, he can have them cancelled and his own put up. But till then, I take my course, and woe to anyone who stands in my way. With that he flung himself down the rocky pathway, and Sarah could not but admire his Viking strength and spirit, as crossing the hill he strode away along the cliffs towards Bude. During the week, no news was heard of Abel, and on Saturday, Eric gave notice of the bands of marriage between himself and Sarah Trefusis. The clergyman would have remonstrated with him, for although nothing formal had been told to the neighbours, it had been understood since Abel's departure that on his return he was to marry Sarah, but Eric would not discuss the question. It is a painful subject, sir, he said, with a firmness which the parson, who was a very young man, could not but be swayed by. Surely there is nothing against Sarah or me. Why should there be any bones made about the matter? The parson said no more, and on the next day he read out the bans for the first time amidst an audible buzz from the congregation. Sarah was present, contrary to custom, and though she blushed furiously, enjoyed her triumph over the other girls whose bans had not yet come. Before the week was over, she began to make her wedding dress. Eric used to come and look at her at work and the sight thrilled through him. He used to say all sorts of pretty things to her at such times, and there were to both delicious moments of lovemaking. The bands were read a second time on the 29th, and Eric's hope grew more and more fixed, though there were to him moments of acute despair when he realised that the cup of happiness might be dashed from his lips at any moment, right up to the last. At such times he was full of passion, desperate and remorseless and he ground his teeth and clenched his hands in a wild way as though some taint of the old berserker fury of his ancestors still lingered in his blood. On the Thursday of that week, he looked in on Sarah and found her, amid a flood of sunshine, putting finishing touches to her white wedding gown. His own heart was full of gaiety, and the sight of the woman who was so soon to be his own so occupied filled him with a joy unspeakable, and he felt faint with languorous ecstasy. Bending over, he kissed Sarah on the mouth and then whispered in her rosy ear, Your wedding dress, Sarah, and for me. As he drew back to admire her, she looked up saucily and said to him, Perhaps not for you. There is more than a week yet for Abel. And then cried out in dismay, for with a wild gesture and a fierce oath, Eric dashed out of the house, banging the door behind him. The incident disturbed Sarah more than she could have thought possible for it awoke all her fears and doubts and indecision afresh. She cried a little, and put by her dress, and to soothe herself went out to sit for a while on the summit of the Flagstaff Rock. When she arrived, she found there a little group anxiously discussing the weather. The sea was calm and the sun bright, but across the sea were strange lines of darkness and light, and close into shore the rocks were fringed with foam, which spread out in great white curves and circles as the currents drifted. The wind had backed and came in sharp, cold puffs. The blowhole, which ran under the flagstaff rock from the rocky bay without to the harbour within, was booming at intervals, and the seagulls were screaming ceaselessly as they wheeled about the entrance of the port. 
It looks bad, she heard an old fisherman say to the coast guard. I seen it just like this once before, when the East Indiaman Coromandel went to pieces in Dizzard Bay. Sarah did not wait to hear more. She was of a timid nature where danger was concerned, and could not bear to hear of wrecks and disasters. She went home and resumed the completion of her dress, secretly determined to appease Eric when she should meet him with a sweet apology, and to take the earliest opportunity of being even with him after her marriage. The old fisherman's weather prophecy was justified. That night at dusk, a wild storm came on. The sea rose and lashed the western coasts from sky to silly and left a tale of disaster everywhere. The sailors and fishermen of Pencastle all turned out on the rocks and cliffs and watched eagerly. Presently, by a flash of lightning, a ketch was seen drifting under only a jib about half a mile outside the port. All eyes and all glasses were concentrated on her, waiting for the next flash, and when it came a chorus went up that it was the lovely Alice, trading between Bristol and Penzance, and touching at all the little ports between. God help them, said the harbour master, for nothing in this world can save them when they are between Bude and Tintagel and the wind on shore. The coast guards exerted themselves, and aided by brave hearts and willing hands, they brought the rocket apparatus up on the summit of the flagstaff rock. Then they burned blue lights so that those on board might see the harbour opening in case they could make any effort to reach it. They worked gallantly enough on board, but no skill or strength of man could avail. Before many minutes were over, the lovely Alice rushed to her doom on the great island rock that guarded the mouth of the port. The screams of those on board were faintly borne on the tempest as they flung themselves into the sea in a last chance for life. The blue lights were kept burning, and eager eyes peered into the depths of the waters in case any face could be seen, and ropes were held ready to fling out in aid. But never a face was seen, and the willing arms rested idle. Eric was there amongst his fellows. His old Icelandic origin was never more apparent than in that wild hour. He took a rope, and shouted in the ear of the harbour master, I shall go down on the rock over the seal cave. The tide is running up and someone may drift in there. Keep back, man, came the answer. Are you mad? One slip on that rock and you are lost, and no man could keep his feet in the dark on such a place in such a tempest. Not a bit, came the reply. You remember how Abel Behenna saved me there on a night like this when my boat went on the gull rock. He dragged me up from the deep water in the seal cave, and now someone may drift in there again as I did, and he was gone into the darkness. The projecting rock hid the light on the flagstaff rock, but he knew his way too well to miss it. His boldness and sureness of foot standing to him, he shortly stood on the great round-topped rock cut away beneath by the action of the waves over the entrance of the seal cave, where the water was fathomless. There he stood in comparative safety, for the concave shape of the rock beat back the waves with their own force, and though the water below him seemed to boil like a seething cauldron, just beyond the spot there was a space of almost calm. The rock too seemed here to shut off the sound of the gale, and he listened as well as watched. As he stood there ready, with his coil of rope poised to throw, he thought he heard below him, just beyond the whirl of the water, a faint despairing cry. He echoed it with a shout that rang into the night. Then he waited for the flash of lightning, and as it passed, flung his rope out into the darkness where he had seen a face rising through the swirl of the foam. The rope was caught, for he felt a pull on it, and he shouted again in his mighty voice, Tie it round your waist, and I shall pull you up. Then when he felt that it was fast, he moved along the rock to the far side of the sea cave, where the deep water was something stiller, and where he could get foothold secure enough to drag the rescued man on the overhanging rock. He began to pull, and shortly he knew from the rope taken in that the man he was now rescuing must soon be close to the top of the rock. He steadied himself for a moment, and drew a long breath, that he might at the next effort complete the rescue. He had just bent his back to the work when a flash of lightning revealed to each other the two men, the rescuer and the rescued. Eric Sanson and Abel Behenna were face to face, and none knew of the meeting save themselves. And God. On the instant, a wave of passion swept through Eric's heart. All his hopes were shattered, and with the hatred of Cain, his eyes looked out. He saw in the instant of recognition the joy in Abel's face, that his was the hand to succour him, 
and this intensified his hate. Whilst the passion was on him, he started back, and the rope ran out between his hands. His moment of hate was followed by an impulse of his better manhood, but it was too late. Before he could recover himself, Abel encumbered with the rope that should have aided him, was plunged with a despairing cry back into the darkness of the devouring sea. Then, feeling all the madness and the doom of Cain upon him, Eric rushed back over the rocks, heedless of the danger and eager only for one thing, to be amongst other people whose living noises would shut out that last cry which seemed to ring still in his ears. When he regained the flagstaff rock, the men surrounded him, and through the fury of the storm he heard the harbour master say, We feared you were lost when we heard a cry. How white you are! Where is your rope? Was there anyone drifted in? No one, he shouted in answer, for he felt that he could never explain that he had let his old comrade slip back into the sea, and at the very place and under the very circumstances in which that comrade had saved his own life. He hoped by one bold lie to set the matter at rest forever. There was no one to bear witness, and if he should have to carry that still white face in his eyes and that despairing cry in his ears forevermore, at least none should know of it. No one, he cried more loudly still. I slipped on the rock and the rope fell into the sea. So saying, he left them, and rushing down the steep path, gained his own cottage and locked himself within. The remainder of that night he passed lying on his bed, dressed and motionless, staring upwards, and seeming to see through the darkness a pale face gleaming wet in the lightning, with its glad recognition turning to ghastly despair and to hear a cry which never ceased to echo in his soul. In the morning the storm was over, and all was smiling again, except that the sea was still boisterous with its unspent fury. Great pieces of wreck drifted into the port, and the sea around the island rock was strewn with others. Two bodies also drifted into the harbour, one the master of the wrecked ketch, the other a strange seaman whom no one knew. Sarah saw nothing of Eric till the evening, and then he only looked in for a minute. He did not come into the house, but simply put his head in through the open window. Well, Sarah, he called out in a loud voice, though to her it did not ring truly. Is the wedding dress done? Sunday week, mind? Sunday week? Sarah was glad to have the reconciliation so easy, but womanlike, when she saw the storm was over and her own fears groundless, she at once repeated the cause of offence. Sunday so be it she said without looking up, if Abel isn't there on Saturday. Then she looked up saucily, though her heart was full of fear of another outburst on the part of her impetuous lover. But the window was empty. Eric had taken himself off, and with a pout she resumed her work. She saw Eric no more till Sunday afternoon, after the bands had been called the third time, when he came up to her before all the people with an air of proprietorship, which half pleased and half annoyed her. Not yet, mister she said, pushing him away as the other girls giggled. Wait till Sunday next, if you please, the day after Saturday, she added, looking at him saucily. The girls giggled again, and the young men guffawed. They thought it was the snub that touched him so that he became as white as a sheet as he turned away. But Sarah, who knew more than they did, laughed, for she saw triumph through the spasm of pain that overspread his face. The week passed uneventfully. However, as Saturday drew nigh, Sarah had occasional moments of anxiety, and as to Eric, he went about at night-time like a man possessed. He restrained himself when others were by, but now and again he went down amongst the rocks and caves and shouted aloud. This seemed to relieve him somewhat, and he was better able to restrain himself for some time after. All Saturday he stayed in his own house and never left it. As he was to be married on the morrow, the neighbours thought it was shyness on his part, and did not trouble or notice him. Only once was he disturbed, and that was when the chief boatman came to him and sat down, and after a pause said, Eric, I was over in Bristol yesterday. I was in the rope makers getting a coil to replace the one you lost the night of the storm, and there I saw Michael Heavens of this place, who is a salesman there. He told me that Abel Behenna had come home the week ere last on the Star of the Sea from Canton, and that he had lodged a sight of money in the Bristol bank in the name of Sarah Behenna. He told Michael so himself, and that he had taken passage on the lovely Alice to Pencastle. Bear up, man, for Eric had with a groan dropped his head on his knees, with his face between his hands. 
He was your old comrade, I know, but you couldn't help him. He must have gone down with the rest that awful night. I thought I'd better tell you, lest it might come some other way, and you might keep Sarah Trefusis from being frightened. They were good friends once, and women take these things to heart. It would not do to let her be pained with such a thing on her wedding day. Then he rose and went away, leaving Eric still sitting disconsolately with his head on his knees. Poor fellow, murmured the chief boatman to himself. He takes it to heart. Well, well, right enough. They were true comrades once, and Abel saved him. The afternoon of that day, when the children had left school, they strayed as usual on half-holidays along the quay and the paths by the cliffs. Presently some of them came running in a state of great excitement to the harbour, where a few men were unloading a coal ketch, and a great many were superintending the operation. One of the children called out, There is a porpoise in the harbour mouth. We saw it come through the blowhole. It had a long tail and was deep under the water. It was no porpoise, said another. It was a seal, but it had a long tail. It came out of the seal cave. The other children bore various testimony, but on two points they were unanimous. It, whatever it was, had come through the blowhole deep under the water and had a long, thin tail, a tail so long that they could not see the end of it. There was much unmerciful chaffing of the children by the men on this point, but as it was evident that they had seen something, quite a number of persons, young and old, male and female, went along the high paths on either side of the harbour mouth to catch a glimpse of this new addition to the fauna of the sea, a long-tailed porpoise or seal. The tide was now coming in. There was a slight breeze, and the surface of the water was rippled so that it was only at moments that anyone could see clearly into the deep water. After a spell of watching, a woman called out that she saw something moving up the channel just below where she was standing. There was a stampede to the spot, but by the time the crowd had gathered, the breeze had freshened, and it was impossible to see with any distinctness below the surface of the water. On being questioned, the woman described what she had seen, but in such an incoherent way that the whole thing was put down as an effect of imagination. Had it not been for the children's report, she would not have been credited at all. Her semi-hysterical statement that what she saw was like a pig with the entrails out was only thought anything of by an old coast guard who shook his head but did not make any remark. For the remainder of the daylight this man was seen always on the bank, looking into the water, but always with disappointment manifest on his face. Eric arose early on the next morning. He had not slept all night, and it was a relief to him to move about in the light. He shaved himself with a hand that did not tremble, and dressed himself in his wedding clothes. There was a haggard look on his face, and he seemed as though he had grown years older in the last few days. Still there was a wild, uneasy light of triumph in his eyes, and he kept murmuring to himself over and over again, This is my wedding day. Abel cannot claim her now, living or dead, living or dead, living or dead. He sat in his armchair, waiting with an uncanny quietness for the church hour to arrive. When the bell began to ring, he arose and passed out of his house, closing the door behind him. He looked at the river and saw the tide had just turned. In the church he sat with Sarah and her mother, holding Sarah's hand tightly in his all the time, as though he feared to lose her. When the service was over they stood up together and were married in the presence of the entire congregation. For no one left the church. Both made the responses clearly, Eric's being even on the defiant side. When the wedding was over, Sarah took her husband's arm and they walked away together the boys and younger girls being cuffed by their elders into a decorous behaviour, for they would fain have followed close behind their heels. The way from the church led down to the back of Eric's cottage, a narrow passage being between it and that of his next neighbour. When the bridal couple had passed through this, the remainder of the congregation, who had followed them at a little distance, were startled by a long, shrill scream from the bride. They rushed through the passage and found her on the bank with wild eyes, pointing to the riverbed opposite Eric Sanson's door. The falling tide had deposited there the body of Abel Behenna, stark upon the broken rocks. The rope trailing from its waist had been twisted by the current round the mooring post, and had held it back whilst the tide had ebbed away from it. The right elbow had fallen in a chink in the rock, leaving the hand outstretched towards Sarah, with the open palm upward as though it were extended to receive hers 
the pale, drooping fingers open to the clasp. All that happened afterwards was never quite known to Sarah Sanson. Whenever she would try to recollect, there would become a buzzing in her ears and a dimness in her eyes, and all would pass away. The only thing that she could remember of it all, and this she never forgot, was Eric's breathing heavily, with his face whiter than that of the dead man as he muttered under his breath, Devil's help, devil's faith, devil's price. Thank you for listening. If you like our recordings, consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks.